Hello and welcome to my basics presentation for Edexcel Combined Science Chemistry Paper 4. This presentation contains basic information so it will get you up to about a grade 5 or 6 but it won't get you further than that. In terms of basic definitions, atoms are the smallest stable particle of matter. Molecules are particles made of two or more atoms bonded together. Elements are substances made from only one type of atom. Compounds are substances made of two or more types of atom bonded together and mixtures are made from two or more different substances, elements or compounds that are mixed together but not bonded. Topics three to four, atomic structure and the periodic table. Are the smallest stable particle of matter. They're made of subatomic particles. Um, protons, which have a massive one, a charge of plus one, are found in the nucleus and are given by the atomic number. Neutrons have a massive one, a charge of zero, are also found in the nucleus and are given by the atomic mass, take away the atomic number. And lastly, we've got electrons, have a mass of one over 1835, a charge of minus one, they're found in shells around the atom, around the nucleus, and they are also given by the atomic number. Here we can see that structure with the nucleus in the middle and the electrons in shells around it. The periodic table uh, is arranged in groups and periods. Groups are the columns, so one, two, three, four, and so on, and periods are the rows, one, two, three, and so on. Note that hydrogen does not belong in any group. The periodic table can help us to determine the structure of atoms. There are two numbers on each element, the atomic mass at the top and the atomic number at the bottom. The atomic number tells us the number of protons and the number of electrons. So for beryllium here, that is four. Um, the atomic mass uh, tells us the number of neutrons. If we do atomic mass, take away the atomic number. So nine minus four gives us five neutrons. Electron configuration tells us how the electrons are arranged around an atom. They're arranged in shells. The first shell can hold two electrons, the second one eight, and the third one also eight. So in the case of lithium here, it has three electrons in total, two in the first shell, one in the second shell, and we can write that as 2.1. Chlorine here has 17 electrons in total, so two in the first shell, eight in the next shell, and seven in the final shell. We can write that as 2.8.7. The group number tells us the number of electrons in the outer shell. So lithium's in group one, has one electron in the outer shell. Chlorine's in group seven, has seven electrons in its outer shell. The period number tells you the number of shells. So lithium is in period two, so it has two shells. Uh, chlorine is in period three, so it has three shells. Isotopes are different versions of an element with the same atomic number, but a different atomic mass. That is the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. Carbon has three isotopes, carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. If we look at their symbols, they've all got the same atomic number, but they've got different atomic masses. So this atomic number is the same, which means they've all got six protons and six electrons. But to find out the neutrons, we do 12 minus six makes six neutrons for carbon 12. 13 minus six is seven neutrons for carbon 13. And 14 minus six is eight neutrons for carbon 14. Topics five to seven on bonding and structure. Now, ionic bonds form when a positive ion is attracted to a negative ion. Ions are atoms with a positive or negative charge. You get cations, which are positive ones formed by losing electrons, and it is metals that form those. Anions are negative ions formed by gaining electrons, and that is done by non-metals. So an ionic bond then is the electrostatic attraction between a positive and a negative ion. To form ionic bonds, electrons are transferred from a metal atom to a non-metal atom. You can see that happening here. Lithium is losing its outer shell electron and giving it to fluorine. That has filled up fluorine's outer shell, creating a negative fluorine ion and a positive lithium, which are attracted to each other, forming an ionic bond. Ionic compounds form what is called a lattice structure. That's shown here. That is a three-dimensional repeating pattern of ions uh, alternating positive, negative, positive, negative. They have a high melting point because melting requires you to break strong electrostatic forces, which takes a lot of heat energy. They do not conduct electricity when they are solid because the ions cannot move. But if you melt them or dissolve them, they do conduct electricity because the ions become free to move. Covalent bonding involves sharing electrons. Um, and you can see that here in this diagram of hydrogen, that shared pair of electrons in the middle there, that is a covalent bond. You need to memorize these diagrams for hydrogen, hydrogen chloride, oxygen, carbon dioxide and methane. If you cannot remember the diagram, at least draw a few overlapping circles with some pairs of electrons in the overlapping bits. And that's quite likely to get you a mark.
Some covalent compounds form simple molecular structures uh, made of molecules. A molecule is a particle made of a few atoms bonded covalently together. So that there is a water molecule made of three atoms bonded together. They have low melting points because the neighbouring molecules are held together by these weak intermolecular forces that does not take much energy to break them, so they have a low melting point. They do not conduct electricity because they have no electrons that are free to move. Other covalent compounds form giant molecular structures with a repeating three-dimensional pattern of atoms joined by covalent bonds. For example, silicon dioxide, diamond, graphite. This here is an example of silicon dioxide where every carbon atom is joined to four oxygens and every oxygen atom is joined to two carbons and that pattern just repeats many times in each direction. They have a high melting point because melting requires you to break strong covalent bonds and they do not conduct electricity because they have no electrons free to move except for graphite which is the exception. A polymer is a large molecule made from many smaller ones joined together. We call those small molecules monomers. You can see monomers in green here. Uh, and here you can see the way all those small monomers have joined together to make our big polymer molecule. Important examples in nature are proteins, which are made from amino acids joined together, and starch, which is made from glucose monomers joined together. Metallic bonding involves delocalized electrons. A delocalized electron is one that rather than just spending its life orbiting one atom is actually free to go on a journey between all of the atoms around it. It just wanders wherever it likes to go. Okay, So that leaves the metal atoms as ions because they've lost their outer shell electrons. So the, ion the metallic bond is the attraction between the lattice of positive metal ions and the cloud of delocalized electrons. Because the electrons are free to move, they conduct electricity. You can see here the electrons going from negative to positive because they're free to move. Topic nine, mass The relative formula mass of a compound is calculated by adding together the masses of all of the uh, atoms that are in it. So for example, with magnesium nitrate, it contains one magnesium atom. So we're going to have one times mg. It contains two nitrogen. So we're going to add two times n. And it contains six oxygen. So we're going to have six times O. We need to use the atomic masses for each one. So magnesium is 24, so one times 24 added to 14 for nitrogen, so 2 times 14. And for oxygen, it is 16, so we're going to have 6 times 16. And if we add all that together, we get a relative uh, formula mass of 148. An empirical formula is a molecular formula expressed as a ratio in its lowest terms. So to do this, we need to find the highest common factor of the numbers in a formula. In this first one, highest common factor of 2 and 4 is 2. So if you divide both of those numbers by 2, we end up with an empirical form of NH2, because 2 divided by 2 is 1, 4 divided by 2 is 2. Here, the highest common factor is of 6, 12 and 6 is 6. So divide each of these numbers by 6, we end up with CH2O. 6 divided by 6 is 1, 12 divided by 6 is 2, 6 divided by 6 is 1. Sometimes the empirical formula and the molecular formula are the same, and you know that if the highest common factor is 1, highest common factor here is 1, so the empirical formula is just going to be H2SO4. To calculate the percentage composition by mass of an element in a compound, for example, the percentage of iron in iron oxide, we need to work out the total amount of the compound, the element in a compound, and divide that by the relative mass of the compound itself. So, for example, the percentage of iron here okay, is going to be, um, work out the total mass of iron, so that is 2 times 56, because 56 is the mass of iron. We're going to need to divide that by the MR of iron oxide, so the MR of iron oxide is going to be 2 times iron, plus 3 times oxygen, so that is 2 times 56 plus 3 times 16, and that comes to 160. So we're going to divide this 2 times 56 by 160 and times it by 100 to make percent. And if we do that, we get 70%. To determine an empirical formula from experimental data, first we'll write down the symbols we've got as, an, uh, as a ratio. So we've got carbon and hydrogen, so we're going to have C dot dot h then write in the data we've got so for carbon we've got 1.5 grams for hydrogen it doesn't tell us but it says the total mass is 2 so the mass must be 1 point, uh, 2 minus 1.5 to give us 0 0.5 grams of that then we divide each of those answers by the relative atomic mass of the um, 
element, so carbon we divide by 12, hydrogen we divide by 1, that gives us 0.125 for carbon and 0.5 for hydrogen. Then what we do is we divide both of those by the smallest of those answers, so divide that by 0.125 and divide this by 0.125 and we get uh, 1 for carbon and 4 for hydrogen, so that tells us that the empirical formula here is CH4. To determine the masses of chemicals involved in a reaction. First of all, we start by writing out the relevant information from the question uh, underneath the things in the formula. So, um, for example, it says what mass of water It's asking what mass of water. So we don't know the mass. We're going to call it X because it is unknown. It can be made from 64 grams of oxygen. So we're going to put 64 underneath oxygen. OK, then it says calculate the MR of each of the relevant things uh, and multiply the MR by the coefficient of them in the equation. So we're going to have one times the MR of O2. OK. So that is going to equal 1 times 2 lots of 16, because 16 is the relative atomic mass of oxygen. So we end up with uh, 32 is our final answer there. Okay. Uh, and for water, we're going to have 2 lots of the MR of H2O. Okay. So that's going to be 2 times 2 times 1 for hydrogen and 1 times 16 for the oxygen. So that is going to come to 2 times that bracket, which gives us... 36. From this, we can construct two fractions that are equal to each other using the top and bottom number there. So 64 over 32 is going to be equal to x over 36. Okay, That rearranges to this. So we can say if we can put the 36 up there, we end up with x equals 64 over 32 times by 36. And if we work that all out that comes to an answer of 72 grams. To find the quantity in moles of a chemical compound we're going to use the equation moles equals mass over molar mass. Okay. Uh, in this question we've got 69 grams of ethanol so the mass is that 69 grams the molar mass we need to work out but that is just the relative formula mass with a g on the end for grams so if we calculate the relative formula mass here we're going to say mr of c2 c2 h 5 oh so that is going to be two times carbon plus six times hydrogen plus one times oxygen so that is two times 12 plus six times one plus one times 16 and that comes to 46 in total. So then we're going to have 69 divided by 46, and that comes to 1.5 mole as our final answer. Topic 13, groups in the periodic table in which we look at alkali metals, halogens, and noble gases. So group one is the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, and potassium. They all react with the water in the same way. So the metal plus water makes metal hydroxide and hydrogen. So sodium and water makes sodium hydroxide and hydrogen and so on. They get more reactive as we go down the group. So lithium just bubbles and floats. Sodium, it melts, bubbles, floats and zips about the surface. And then potassium, it melts, bubbles, floats, zips about the surface and makes a lilac flame. The reason for this is because potassium is most reactive. The reason why is because its outer electron is further away from the nucleus. So it is less attracted. So it's more easily removed from the nucleus, which makes it more reactive. Group 7 is the halogens, chlorine, bromine and iodine. Chlorine Cl2 is a green gas, bromine Br2 is a brown liquid and iodine I2 is a silvery grey solid. They react with metals uh, as follows, halogen and metal makes a metal halide, for example chlorine and sodium makes uh, sodium chloride. Halogens react with hydrogen to make a hydrogen halide. So, for example, bromine and hydrogen makes hydrogen bromide. Now, the test for chlorine is that chlorine will uh, will turn damp blue litmus paper red and then bleach it white. So it goes red first and then bleaches white. And we can see that happening here. The reactivity of halogens uh, increases up the group, decreases down the group. The reason why is because they gain electrons when they react. Um, the halogens near the top of the group have fewer shells of electrons, so the electrons will be closer to the um, uh, nucleus and therefore more strongly attracted, um, which makes them more reactive. The displacement reactions of halogens you can see here, the basic idea is that the more reactive halogen will be able to displace the less reactive halide from a salt. So in this case, sodium, bromide and fluorine you will get a reaction because fluorine is more reactive than bromine, so it can displace it, and you make sodium fluoride and bromine. That would not happen in reverse because bromide is less reactive than fluorine. 
The noble gases are group zero. These are unreactive gases. The other word for that is inert. Now that is helium, HE, neon, NE, argon, AR, and krypton, KR. They are all unreactive. They're all inert because they've got full outer shells, so they have no need to react. Their use is helium is used in airships because it is less dense than air and doesn't explode like hydrogen tends to. And we have neon, which is used in neon lights because it glows red when electricity is passed through it. We have krypton, which makes a bright white flash for photography. And argon is used to replace the air in wine bottles to stop the air from oxidising the alcohol. Topics 14 to 15, rates of reaction and energy change. We look at rates of reaction and endothermic versus exothermic reactions. Now, rates of reaction. We're talking about the amount of product formed every second, and the rate of reaction is just one divided by the time the reaction takes. And we measure rates of reaction by looking at changes. So we, we can either collect gas in a gas syringe like this, or we can collect... Um, we can measure the loss of mass as gas bubbles out of a reaction like this if we do it on a balance um, or we can do the obscured cross technique where something gets gradually cloudy and we time how long it takes to stop being able to see a cross that is marked underneath a beaker. The rate of a chemical reaction is always fast at the start and then it decreases over time. So if we produce a graph of the concentration of say reactants over time, the amount of, con the amount of reactants decreases very quickly at first and then it gradually gets shallower and shallower. Um, this steep bit is where the reaction is fastest. The shallow bit here is where the reaction is slower. So on these graphs, the gradient is the rate of reaction. If you want to calculate the gradient, you do the change in Y divided by the change in X. Reaction rates are controlled by something called collision theory, which says that to, in order to react, particles must collide and they must have enough energy when they collide. That energy is called the activation energy. If we increase the concentration, that means there are going to be more particles, so there will be more collisions, so there will be more reactions. If we increase the pressure of a gas, that means the particles are going to be closer together, so there will be more collisions, so there will be more reactions. If we increase the surface area by breaking one big part particle into lots of small particles, we increase the number of particles exposed to reactions, so there'll be more collisions and more reactions. And lastly, if we increase the temperature, there'll be more collisions because the particles are moving faster and those collisions will have more energy, so there'll be more reactions. In the rates of reaction core practical, we investigated how surface area affects the rate of reaction by placing 50 centimetres cubed of hydrochloric acid in a conical flask with 5 grams of marble chips and we had a measuring cylinder upturned um, and filled with water in a beaker of water and the idea was that when we put the bung on and we started the timer the gas bubbled up here through the delivery tube and into the measuring cylinder and it pushed the water out of the tube making a bigger and bigger bubble inside here and we measured how much um, air was in there every 30 seconds and then what we did was we repeat it with five grams of larger marble chips and we found that the smaller marble chips reacted more quickly because they had a bigger surface area. We then investigated how temperature affects the rate of reaction by using 50 centimetres cubed of sodium thiosulfate and reacting with um, hydrochloric acid. And we placed them both in a water bath and then we uh, 30 degrees Celsius and then we mixed them um, and we found that it went cloudy and we, we monitored this using the obscured cross technique. So there was a black cross drawn uh, on a piece of paper and over time as the reaction got cloudier and cloudier and cloudier, that cross just uh, slowly disappeared um, and that allowed us to monitor the rate of reaction. We found that the hotter it was, the faster the reaction went. Um, with both of these, we can calculate rate as one divided by the time it took. Catalysts are substances that speed up chemical reactions without being used up, and they work by decreasing the activation energy, meaning that more of the collisions lead to reactions. Um, we can see that here on this reaction profile, the height of the hump here, that is the activation energy, and you can see that with a catalyst, that activation energy is lower um, because it's been lowered by the catalyst. Uh, important examples of catalysts, um, we see them being used in catalytic converters in our car exhausts to make the exhaust gases less harmful, and uh, enzymes which uh, work by the lock and key method uh, um, are catalysts as well. For example, the way that the enzymes in yeast are used in ethanol production. Exothermic reactions are reactions that release energy and get hotter, and that involves breaking weaker chemical bonds and making stronger chemical bonds. And if we draw a reaction profile of that, we can see that the reactants have more energy and the products have less energy. And so that difference in the two, that is the energy that is given out. Um, endothermic reactions involve um, uh, absorbing energy so they get colder, and that involves breaking strong bonds, which takes a lot of energy, and making weak bonds, which only gives out a little bit of energy. And again, if we look at the reaction profile, we can see the reactants have less energy and the products have more energy. And that difference there, that is the energy that's been absorbed. We can tell whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic by measuring the temperature before 
and after. And if it goes up, it's exothermic. If it goes down, it's endothermic. Um, if we're doing this, make sure we've got an insulated container so we're not gaining or losing heat from somewhere else. Now, making and breaking bonds. Breaking bonds absorbs energy. Making bonds releases energy. So the difference between those two explains whether something's endothermic or exothermic. And we can calculate the energy change involved in a chemical reaction if we know the strength of each of the bonds in kilojoules per mole. And all we do is we add up the strength of all of the every single bond in the uh, products and we take it away from the strength of every single bond in the reactants. Um, for example, like here, we've got one, two, three, four, five carbon hydrogen bonds. So we'd have to have five lots of the carbon hydrogen bond there. And over here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbon hydrogen bonds. So we'd take it away from six lots of the carbon hydrogen bonds over on this side. A negative value on this uh, reaction uh, calculation is an exothermic reaction. Topic 16, fuels, where we look at hydrocarbons, crude oil, combustion and cracking. Hydrocarbons are substances containing only hydrogen and carbon. So that and that are hydrocarbons, but this one's not because it's also got the oxygen there. Now, they make excellent fuels. However, they do release carbon dioxide, which can cause global warming. Uh, and uh, they're also non-renewable, which means they're running out. They also use a feedstock to make lots of other important chemicals like plastics, for example. Now, crude oil is a mixture of many different hydrocarbons that we get from deep underground. Now, to get these separate things out of it, we have to do fractional distillation, which separates out each of the different compounds according to their different boiling points. Now, what happens is we heat the crude oil here, and then it, uh, all of it, or most of it, boils, and the vapours rise up the fractionating column. But as they rise up, they get cooler, and each of them end up condensing at their own different boiling point. And so the things with the lowest boiling point go furthest up the column and come out here. Things with a much lower boiling point, or higher boiling point rather, don't rise up so far and condense and much lower down the column. Now, each of these different um, boiling points we call a different fraction. Okay? And each fraction has a different molecule length, a different ease of ignition, different boiling point, different viscosity. So the main fractions, we've got our gases, petrol, kerosene, diesel oil, fuel oil and bitumen. Gases are used for cooking and heating at home. Um, petrol is used for um, uh, as a fuel for cars. Kerosene is aeroplane fuel. Um, diesel oil is used for uh, fueling big vehicles. Um, fuel oil is used to power ships and bitumen is used to surface roads. Um, now this goes in order from shortest to longest molecules. So gases are shortest, bitumen is longest. Um, gases are easiest to ignite, bitumen is hardest to ignite. Um, Gases have the lowest boiling point, bitumen has the highest boiling point. Um, gases are least viscous, that means they're the runniest, and um, bitumen is most viscous, so it's thick and sticky. A homologous series is a family of very closely related compounds that have the same general formula, and they just differ by the amount of CH2s each time. Now, importantly, they've got the similar chemical properties and they have a gradual change in their physical properties. So you can see here, this is um, something called the alkanes. And we can see their boiling points gradually increase as we go uh, up the series. Now, the alkanes are one of these homologous series. The first three of them are methane, ethane and propane. Methane is CH4, ethane C2H6, propane C3H8. And they all have this same general formula, CN. H2N plus 2. Um, to work out their structure, just join the carbons together. So one carbon there, two carbons joined together, three carbons joined together here, and then fill everything else in with hydrogens to make sure that each carbon has a total of four bonds. Combustion, aka burning, is the reaction of fuels with oxygen. It can either be complete, in which case fuel and oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water, or incomplete, in which case fuel and oxygen makes carbon monoxide and carbon and some carbon dioxide and some water. And exactly how much of each depends on how much oxygen is present. Um, now, there are problems with this. A carbon dioxide is toxic. It stops our blood from carrying oxygen, which means we die quickly. Um, the carbon uh, also known as soot can cause respiratory problems like asthma and also it can cause um, uh, buildings to get blackened which looks ugly and it can block flu pipes which can um, be dangerous in the home. Burning fuels can produce air pollution. For example, uh, in coal, there are small amounts of sulphur, which is an impurity. When you burn the coal, you also burn the sulphur, and that makes sulphur dioxide. When the sulphur dioxide goes into the air, it hits the clouds and dissolves to make sulfurous acid. And that then turns into sulfuric acid, and that produces acid rain, which is rain with a pH of less than two. That acid rain damages the environment. It can kill forests, it can poison lakes and things like that. It can also damage buildings. Look at the um, erosion uh, or corrosion rather on this statue here. 
Um, nitrogen oxide can also be produced by burn the high temperatures inside co internal combustion engines in cars and other vehicles. Um, that can also produce acid rain and it can produce smog, which is this toxic chemical fog. Cracking is used to break long chain hydrocarbons into smaller ones. The longer chain hydrocarbons are less useful. The smaller chain ones are more useful so that companies can make more money by making more than more useful ones. So it's very easy. You heat the hydrocarbon and you pass the hot vapors over aluminium oxide catalyst. And that breaks, uh, for example, an alkane down into another shorter alkane and an alkene. We can see that happening here. This one long octane molecule has become a small ethene molecule and a hexane molecule. Note the total number of carbon and hydrogen atoms remains the same at all times. Hydrogen is a potential fuel for the future. It's a brilliant thing because when you burn it, it produces no carbon dioxide. Hydrogen oxygen just makes water. And it can also be used in fuel cells, which are a type of super efficient battery. However, hydrogen doesn't exist naturally on the uh, earth on its own so we have to make the hydrogen and that can produce carbon dioxide depending on where the energy to do that comes from also there's very little infrastructure there are not many hydrogen pumps at petrol stations yet although they are starting to appear and it's also difficult to store which makes it a bit of a technological challenge topic 17 the atmosphere in which we look at the early atmosphere the changing atmosphere and climate change now, the early atmosphere contained a lot more carbon dioxide than now, and that is due mostly to volcanoes. We know that because, for example, Mars and Venus, um, which are also rocky planets like us, have lots of volcanoes and lots of carbon dioxide. It had lots more water vapour. That's because it was too hot for there to be liquid water available. Um, over time, the Earth cooled and that water condensed to form the oceans. Uh, there was no oxygen. And we know that because the oldest rocks on Earth contain minerals that cannot form around oxygen. For example, something called pyrite. Um, there are some people that think that actually maybe the, nit the atmosphere was mostly nitrogen because, for example, Saturn's moon Titan is mostly nitrogen. However, the important difference is that we are a rocky planet, but Titan is mostly made of ice. The modern atmosphere is very different to the early one with much less carbon dioxide and much more oxygen. Now this happened because over time a lot of the carbon dioxide dissolved in the oceans which reduced the amount in the atmosphere and sea creatures made their shells from it in the form of calcium carbonate which locked that carbon dioxide up and uh, completely removed it from the atmosphere. Um, also the photosynthesis um, first by cyanobacteria and then by plants used up carbon dioxide and released oxygen. Now the modern atmosphere uh, is made of 78% nitrogen, 21-ish percent uh, oxygen, about 1% argon, and trace amounts of other gases, including carbon dioxide at 0.03%. Uh, that is rising quickly. Um, now, the greenhouse effect uh, is the way that the planet Earth is kept warmer than normal by the effect of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and water, which trap the sun's heat and prevent it from escaping. The greenhouse effect is a good thing. However, because humans have come along and we're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect is getting stronger and that is leading to global warming. And we know this is happening because of evidence from ice cores, uh, temperature records going back over time and satellite data as well. Now, climate change caused by global warming is a very bad thing. Um, it is increasing global temperatures, which sounds good, actually isn't good. Um, it is changing rainfall patterns, which is causing flooding in some areas and drought in other areas. It is melting the polar ice caps, um, which is causing sea level rise and destroying habitats um, for things like polar bears and uh, seals and stuff like that. Um, and it's causing living organisms to shift their habitats, which is fine for those that can move, but big trouble for those that can't. So we have to limit climate change um, by reducing the amount of carbon dioxide we produce, um, by using renewable energy, which doesn't produce carbon dioxide, by eating less meat, because that is a big greenhouse gas producer. Uh, and there are also some big technological ideas like putting giant uh, mirrors and things in space to reflect some of the sunlight away. Thank you for listening. The end.